So my name is uh, Father Rory Brady. I am a Catholic priest in the Diocese of Raffoe, which is northwest of Ireland. And we, my parish is called Killock Tea. And I live right on the sea where we have plenty of wind and rain and plenty of storms, especially the last, the last few weeks. And my home place is about 10 minutes from here. And I am beside a Killybegs, which is a large fishing port in Ireland. My childhood, growing up, we, I had five brothers younger than me, and I had one older sister. Our home was a Catholic home where we would have been taught the faith as best as our parents could. My mother was a teacher, and my father worked with the telephone company. And my mother had a great faith and she was instrumental, I suppose, in handing on the faith to us. My father had been a bit more relaxed. He, he would have done his duty, but not, he wouldn't have been anyway extroverted as regards practicing the faith. My mother passed away, sadly, when I was about 19, leaving five younger than me, my youngest brother made his confirmation the week after she was she was buried. But she did leave a you know great legacy for us. And often I say to people, particularly teachers and parents, that young people or children will listen to what you say but they will learn from what you do. And often things she done when we were growing up we were saying, why is she going to visit that person and doing these things and she's getting no thanks for what she's doing. And only later on then did we realize what she was, she was doing. She was living out the Christian, Christian values, the Christian virtues, love of God and love of neighbor. In my teenage years, I would have had a faith to a certain degree, but it was not something I wanted to be publicizing. And I remember believing what, you know, the church was teaching but not understanding it. And I suppose my religious upbringing and particular teaching in school and that, the catechesis w wasn't great. And we kind of seen it as a free class, so we didn't take it seriously. But I remember then, my mother used to go to mass often during the week. She would never force us to go to mass, obviously during the week, but she would say, if anyone wants to go to Mass, I'm going now in the next five minutes. And even the year I was doing my leaving cert, my final year exams in, in secondary school, I said half an hour in the day is not, not, not too much to, to give to God. And I will be asking God to help me with my exams, my studies, and I suppose in whatever career path I was to choose. I had no instinct of becoming a priest at that stage. I was conscious of having a faith and living it. But I have to admit, my God in my teenage years and indeed in my early 20s probably was sport and Gaelic football, soccer, any sport at all. And that was what kept me going. It probably gave me a sense of self-esteem as well. I was good at the sport. It gave me an opportunity to expressed myself and then naturally with the spirit of the world as well I was keen on going socializing and out meeting my friends and girlfriends as well and so it was if I couldn't get out for a night maybe at weekends or Christmas I'd be thinking this is a terrible disaster. I remember also when I went off to college after my leaving started in 1987, 1988. There used to be October devotions where the rosary was prayed in the local church. And I often thought, thank God I don't have to stay for that. That was my thinking as regards the faith. And so I was possibly practicing Catholic by a name, but not by deed. I do remember going to college and I was living the party life and 
socializing and I used to drink as well at, at that stage and playing the sport and I thought to myself just keep God on side so I, I would, went to mass at the weekend even when I was at college but and my prayer life would have been minimal enough I was conscious of I suppose not cutting God out of my life altogether Looking back now, I realise that, like St. Augustine, I, our hearts are restless until they rest in you, Lord. And I suppose we're always searching for happiness and joy and fulfilment. And initially I probably thought this was in, if I had you know, a sporting career. So I did play at county level, which would be a reasonable high level at Gaelic football for my county, Donegal. We played in an All-Ireland schools final and I thought this is you know this is this is great but I realized that sport has more downs and ups and it's and I remember then when I was teaching I was off sick one time and I thought to myself if I was to come before God if God called me from this world what would I have to show him and I realised actually I had a very little to show him as regards being a Catholic. Now the question could be asked, how did it come to be studying for the priesthood or discern that call? So I suppose during those years in my early 20s, I decided you know, to, to grow in my faith that bit more. And I suppose that sickness also had an effect. It made me just thinking philosoph you know, uh, philosophically about where am I going? What, what is the purpose of my life? And as I prayed, and particularly so, my mother, my earthly mother, Annie, had a great influence in my early years, but my heavenly mother as well started having a, a greater impact. And I realized that I, you know, I had come across some books on, on various apparitions and so on. My mother had gone to Medjugorje in the 1980s and she'd been to Lourdes back in the 1950s before I was even born. And she had kind of imbued a certain love for a lady in my heart. And I, in deepening that, I started praying the rosary. I wouldn't say I prayed it too kind of prayerfully. I would have been more so out of, out of fear, maybe to a certain degree. And, and maybe just when I read some of these messages of the likes of Fatima as well, I realized you know, Our Lady was saying, pray the rosary. And at the same time, there was a sense of uh, to give something back to God and to others. So my mother had been in Africa as a teacher for two years back in the 19, early 60s. And then she came back and got married to my father, Charlie. And it turned out, I said, this is something I could do. Maybe I could go to work as a teacher in Africa, volunteer for a year or two and see how it goes. So as I did pray, I remember talking to a priest in confessions at Christmas 1995. And so I went to confessions and at the end of it, I just said to the priest, how would you know God is calling you to, to be a priest or how would you, what? And the priest gave me a very simple answer, but it was a very wise answer. He said, well, look, at, just keep praying. Keep uh, turning, asking God and asking Our Lady to guide you. He says, come back to me in six months' time. And so when the six months came up, that was June 1996, I remember going to a, a religious house down the country. I was coming back from my work in, in the Midlands. I was teaching down in a, a secondary school teaching woodwork and drawing and had left the school at just the beginning of the summer holidays, at the beginning of June. I said, I'm going to leave a bit of work now. I'll come back a few days early before school starts and I will take up the, the work again. And I was running through my mind the different reasons why I couldn't be a priest. I had a permanent teaching post. I had a new car. I had a girlfriend. 
I also had to think of my reputation. What would my, not just my friends think? I used to play football with the local sports team, local football team. I said, what will they think? What will my family think? My mother passed away at this stage, so I said, you know, I need to think about these. But I, as I ticked off the reasons why I couldn't, I realized these actually weren't good enough reasons. And I decided on that journey home, I said, I'm going to go to study for the priesthood. Now, I didn't jump head first in like St. Peter walking on the water. I decided I was going to take a leave of absence from my job for one year. So I had to contact the school principal. She was a religious sister and I said to her that I was thinking of taking a leave of absence. I only had been teaching for two years in that school. And she, she said, fine, that's fine. So that was one obstacle overcome. I also when spoke to my father back home. I remember it was a Saturday evening when I arrived in and I said I had a bit of news and I said that I was thinking of going on to study for the priesthood. So I remember him sitting there reading the newspaper and he, his glasses and as he looked over his glasses and put down the newspaper he said I think you're joining a sinking ship and I said to him well, I said no th this is not the Titanic this ship is not going to sink. I said, it's taking on a lot of water, all right, I said, but it's not going to sink. And I knew he was thinking of 1996 was also the time there was many scandals in the church, particularly in Ireland. And I really was going against the flow. And I said to myself, I have to take a chance, but also I have to trust in God as well, and Our Lady. And part of me realized that there was a certain harmony, there was a certain peace within me that this was... This was actually what God wanted of me. So on the 7th of October, I was down with students from my school as one of my roles in as a priest was chaplain in a boys' school. And we gathered with other students from all over Ireland in Knock on the 7th of October, 2014. And just after the lunch break, I was meeting some of my students. And as I walked away, I had as they call it, an episode or an epileptic seizure. And I don't remember anything of that moment. But when I came around, I was in the little local health center getting medical treatment. And an ambulance was on its way to take me to hospital in Castlebar, County Mayo. So when I was brought to the hospital, I had to undergo scans and so on, and an MRI scan. And when I met with the nurse and the doctor, uh, this was a day or two later, that they had the results of the scan. So the scan results said that I had a brain tumor and that I had to be transferred to the main hospital for brain surgery in Ireland, in Beaumont Hospital in Dublin. And that I had to undergo a brain operation, possibly that within the next few days. And sometimes we think, you know, as priests or, you know, we're working for God, that God's going to look after us, that everything's going to work out smooth and perfect. And then when we look back, we realize, you know, that's not the way life works. And so I often used to say to the, the boys in school when I was teaching them in the religion classes, I said, just because you pray doesn't mean that everything works out as, as you want. And so I said, I didn't go back teaching in that school again because I was off. Obviously, I did have a major operation, brain surgery, two operations in the space of, of a couple of weeks. But the operation took place on the feast of St. Teresa of Avila, who is the patron saint for people with headaches. That was the 15th of October. And I had another surgery again on the 1st of November, which was the feast of all saints. But during that time when I was in hospital, many people were praying for me, even in every continent. The other comparable time was the day I was ordained a priest. I see that as one of the happiest days of my life. It was a beautiful day. I was 
ordained with two other priests in our cathedral in Letterkenny. So there was, the cathedral was full, but it was a great, great time. And celebrating my first mass as well I, in my local church, which is a little country church, but again, it was a great welcome. I remember a young man asking me one time, what is my greatest you know, happiness or joy as a priest? And after thinking of it for a few moments, he said, I suppose the most important thing is when you see somebody that is doing God's will and that they are striving to live their faith fully. And this is one of the things that has been a great help was meeting, especially young people at retreats organized by Youth 2000. Usually weekend retreats where you'd meet them and get an opportunity to chat to them and they'd have questions about different things, about the faith and about life and relationships and and helping to discern, you know, what is what is it God wants in their life. So again, that ability to to socialize, ability to meet with people and and in a parish setting, as a, as a diocesan priest, you meet with all sorts. And it is a great joy, especially when somebody who has been away from their faith for a long time and have come back to, to practice their faith. And as Jesus said, you know, the great joy in heaven, among, even among the angels, when the repentant the sinner comes back to, to being with God. And I think importantly too is to have a sense of humour. Life is too short too. It's not so many think the church is all doom and gloom and sadness, but the reality is the, the happiest and most fulfilled people I've met are those who, who live out their faith and, and, the, and the importance of having a sense of humour that this helps us even deal with sometimes the crosses and difficulties that everyone's going to experience in life. My role as a vocation director, now I'm in that role over 10 years, and a key thing when I meet somebody for the first time that is maybe discerning are they being called to the priesthood I will ask them you know what you know what are they doing you know are they studying are they working I ask them you know different questions but I also ask them about their you know what is their hobbies and pastimes what you know what is their prayer life like and what we're looking for today and what I'm looking for is that a young man that is balanced that he has different aspects to his life and and the whole thing of formation is not about that you go in as the perfect priest or go in as a perfect seminarian or a perfect person. But discernment is part of the process. And then when you go off to study, wherever it may be, that you're also in the process of being formed. And even when you're ordained, we are not perfect priests. We do think we are. Actually, when you're ordained, you think you are. You, some think they are the Messiah, they're going to save everyone. And gradually we realize, no, that doesn't work that way. So I just prayed as best as I could. Some of you are not fit to pray, and that's often why people wonder. When we pray at Mass, you know, during the intercession, we pray for, for different people, especially the sick, because often you're not fit to pray for yourself. And Twice after the operation, like I was in the high dependency unit with tubes and lines coming out of me, and and you're not fit to pray. You're under the effects of anaesthetic and so on. And this is where the beautiful gift of our brothers and sisters in the faith in this world, but also in heaven, the saints and the holy angels interceding for us. And I often remember too going back for checkups every six months I used to go back for MRI scans but I also had to meet with doctors and surgeons and and you'd be in the waiting room with 
other people who had undergone maybe operations and are, were awaiting operations, but all with cancer. And I said, I must, as I prayed, as I sat in the waiting room, I just said, I had a little rosary bead to my hand or my finger, rosary ring, I would pray it and just offer it up for different people. People maybe who had kind of lost hope and their families as well. And thankfully, that's one thing I look back, I say, thank God I never lost hope, I said. And I wasn't afraid to die either, but it's easy saying it until you're faced with that reality, but I just said, I take it one day at a time. I said, this, this is part of God's plan. And sometimes you know that we have to sanctify the hospital wards as well by our presence, by our prayer as well. So this is a key thing as well. If we want to grow in our faith, the rosary is a powerful way. And it also will help us to, to come to know the Mass as well. This is where the scriptures, when we hear it for the first time, we often think these things are, you can't understand them. And this is where we, it's not enough to spend time one reading. We need to sit, reflect, meditate upon them as well. And the scriptures do challenge us. And this is where sometimes maybe we don't like the challenge that the scriptures put before us, but this is, the, this is what we, it needs to be to be a Christian, to be an authentic disciple today, uh, to follow the words that Jesus said then are the same today, that the words are alive and active, they're challenging us. And so we don't have to go far away, but just living our faith in our, where we live and socialize and work and rest and relax. This, this is where God wants us to be, to sanctify, to make each day a day of blessing. Every day is a gift from God, so that's why. And I suppose that is why when I was sick too, I said, this is God, this is where you've put me now, be it a hospital bed, be it in a recuperating at home, or be it getting radiotherapy or chemotherapy. This is where you've put me, God. Um, so you have a reason I offer, I'll offer this up for you and for maybe those that struggle to accept that's where they are too. That, and so this is what we have to do: is to accept God's will and as best as we can. And Are you searching for purpose of life? <laughs> Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World.